Welcome to week five in this course. Last week, we had an in-depth look at the post-colonial heritage conservation of communities, in particular, indigenous communities. We outlined the issues that arise when institutional top-down actors control and direct heritage value, including problems in recognizing intangible heritage in particular, and explored and explained uh, these issues as a vital component in preserving and conserving Indigenous heritage for Indigenous communities. The case study of the Dukan Gorge Caves was used as a prime example of the destruction of sacred Aboriginal Australian heritage um, that had significant social and cultural value for the Aboriginal communities and their sense of heritage, identity and belonging. So this week's discussion will be around the ideas of what is heritage well-being, how does cultural heritage affect our sense of well-being, and the overarching question under these frameworks of what actually constitutes a good life. The case study for this week will be heritage and well-being frameworks of what works well-being, which is from ICCROM, and also a framework from English heritage. So, over the years, a growing understanding and recognition towards heritage conservation has shaped a transformation of thought, understanding that in recent years, the practice of conservation is not just about preserving material things, but rather, it is about the safeguarding and sharing of heritage in order to uphold and advance a betterment for people's lives and the ecological and social environment we all live within. This change in thought has been amplified and utilized as a progressive instrumental tool for positive change and aligns with an overall social movement towards viewing individuals and or our ecosystems through a holistic lens. The article from ICCROM, the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural po Property, an intergovernmental body aligned with ICOMOS and UNESCO, explores the origins of this growing awareness and the role of heritage within sustainable development and well being to ask how this connection might be made more evident and what implications this might have for conservation. The body states that the prevailing worldview that prosperity is synonymous with progress is changing. Economic measures such as the GNP and the GDP adopted since the 1940s by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank as a means to gauge development have been the focus on increasing criticism for many decades. And now the 21st century challenges such as the climate crisis, mass migration, globalization and food insecurity, land degradation and more are further deconstructing this belief. The global community is increasingly realizing that a development body based solely on financial enrichment does not guarantee improvements to living standards and at the time is a serious threat to environmental stability. The current dominant metrics say little about how the benefits of economic growth are shared and thereby fail to address inequality and other urgent social issues. In consequence, there are increasing calls for a more meaningful, holistic and sustainable development model that better reflects human needs and aspirations and is not limited to economic security alone. The roots of these considerations go back as far as the 18th century and utilitarian thinkers such as the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who in 1781 proposed the production of net happiness as a basis for determining the metrics of any action. However, it is the work of economics, economists such as 
Amata Sen in the 1980s who redefined development in terms of what it enabled people to do. Sen's capabilities approach summarized in his words as the expansion of the capabilities of persons to lead the kinds of lives they value and have reason to value has a significant impact and is a basis for ongoing efforts to establish a new framework based on well-being. This conscious shift is taking place all over the world. Many countries such as Bhutan, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Germany and Canada have already adopted alternative indicators for development that reflect not only economic but social and environmental outcomes as a means to shape their policies and measure progress. In addition, the adoption of a larger set of markers to reflect well-being within official statistics provides a more nuanced understanding of local contexts, thus guiding more efficient and relevant policy making that focuses on the aspects of life that citizens truly value. Similarly, international organizations have implemented programs to measure and promote well-being. Initiatives such as Human Development Index of the United Nations Development Program and the Better Life Index of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development have already launched. However, well-being is more than a development model. It is about fundamental rights. Its inclusion in legal con Conventions takes its root in nothing less than the proclamation of, un of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Here, the intrinsic connection between well-being and the fundamental human rights is explicitly stated, and this linkage has been further reinforced by its integration within subsequent environmental and cultural rights law. Thus, Invested with a moral purpose, changing from a purely economic to a more holistic model of development is an ethic imperative that is inherently linked to the respect of human dignity. So, what does well-being mean to cultural heritage? As established above, the idea of well-being being a part of human integrity and a necessity in leading a quality life. The ICCROM also initiated that while well-being is historically understood as relating to our physical bodies and human health, the understanding is growing to incorporate overall basic human health conditions living within a social world, such as housing, freedom of choice, work-life balance, access to nutrition and healthcare, basic principles implemented in a socially liberal state. Therefore, this understanding is more commonly linked with the desire that all individuals have the social mobility to make individual educated choices about their well-being and what this means to them. The social goal is universal in nature and holistic in its approach. This ideology is implemented in the understanding of the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development under the ICCROM, stating that well-being is in fact a far more wide-reaching concept. Well-being is the enabling of an environment that can holistically support individual citizens, physical, mental, emotional, social, cultural, spiritual, and economic needs as they can achieve their potential. The ICCROM's agenda for 2030 is thoroughly focused on this approach of holistic perspective that, that they state underpins their cross-cutting model for a sustainable future development and that the conscious and effective implementation of which is fundamental for the well-being of not only current but also our future generations. Furthermore, this approach is highly necessary given the urgency to address the global climate emergency. Therefore, the imperative of this body, and in cases discussed later in this lecture, the following trend from other heritage bodies and top-down actors, shows that sustainable development is a clear necessity for a universal and inclusive well-being for all members of society. The ICCR 
OMS, well-being model, seeks to enhance the aspects of life that people value the most and in doing so lays the foundations for a different approach to governance. Furthermore, it states that since what matters is variable and context-dependent, focusing on well-being implies a grassroots approach, i.e. people's opinions must be taken into account. What applies to heritage this approach demands decision-making processes that respect what is meaningful to people and their communities. The paradigm shift underscores the need for people-centered approaches in heritage conservation and connects these to wider global political movements. So why is heritage important for well-being? Well, heritage is a part of the cultural fabric of our society and understood through a cultural lens. Promoting well-being through heritage conservation impacts us on a universal level. The ICCROM's vision of heritage conservation is founded on promoting effective people-centered approaches as a means of ensuring inclusivity and diversity so that heritage is able to contribute to people's lives in ways that are meaningful to them as individuals rather than just focusing on the collective whole. Fundamental to this is the view that local communities are attributors to, of what matters to them and that they have a central voice in decision-making processes that affect their heritage. This human-centered and community-centered approach is the ICCROM's concept for placing people at the center of heritage conservation and is closely aligned with promoting sustainable development and well-being under a GDP model. However, more needs to be done to understand this relationship and consciously orient conservation towards social impact. Emphasizing such outcomes as the ultimate goal of heritage conservation is important to inspire professionals in the design and community-oriented projects and management systems that benefit people, especially those that are marginalized. So, is there a catch? Well, although the concept of well-being has been around for a long time and has been understood on a GDP level, there is widely used in social and economic research a common consensus of its definition being lacking. So, matters are further complicated by this divergence of values among communities as it is contextually understood and subjectively relevant to many communities the idea of what well-being is for them and what heritage identity is for them. When comparing theoretical and empirical viewpoints from different countries, it can be challenging to reconcile the various interpretations of well-being and the way in which international institutions and top-down actors apply this concept to local heritage issues from an institutional, bureaucratic and lawful lens. In addition, despite receiving increasing government attention, as stated above through these NGOs and institutional bodies, including UNESCO and the UN. Well-being at an economic level is still an emergent field and quite misunderstood. There are noticeable developments though. In 2019, New Zealand became the first country to publicly state that their alignment of its GDP budget will include a national well-being framework. Significantly within the cultural identity, this is included as one of the key domains of well-being, being that cultural identity effectively impacts our sense of community belonging, placehood, social ties, and our overall sense of well-being. This framework is specific to the cultural dynamics of New Zealand and addresses the well-being of New Zealanders as a people, rather than a universal understanding of well-being on a worldwide and global level. Therefore, this New Zealand-centric approach is welcome, but a long way from accepting and understanding how we can universally apply this 
concept of well-being and heritage well-being being a economic and uh, institutional issue that should be applied and understood at a government level. So how can we promote well-being through heritage conservation after we have stated the many problematic pitfalls that it faces? So to begin, the ICCROM believes that to answer this question, it is necessary to define the meaning, application and measurement of well-being and its relationship to heritage. To do this transdisciplinary approach, something else is required that draws on sectors outside of cultural heritage to incorporate the latest and most progressive thinking regarding human development, human behavior and well-being. In particular, the research that is needed to understand this field draws on the ways and the evidence that heritage benefits uh, us as a collective and how this semantic language skills and practical tools can support the interaction between heritage professionals and local communities to implement community focused and led approaches. As a first step in this reflection, the ICCROM holds a workshop on heritage sustainability and well-being in 2019, drawing together thinkers from well-being economics, human rights legislation and heritage conservation practice. This event seeks to identify common language and concepts that serve as a basis to support and recognize the sustainable use of heritage as a tool for well-being development. This work is part of the ICCROM's research initiative called Tracking Trends that was launched in 2018 as a means to examine the core trends in heritage conservation. Its current focus was on heritage conservation and sustainable development, and in particular, how the impacts of heritage are assessed and represented with indicator frameworks. To conclude, the efforts and to connect the goals of heritage conservation, in particular shown by the ICCROM, are uh, uh, sustainable for well-being development to a degree. This is in turn a demand of a close examination of how heritage is valued by civil society and its impacts measured by government. In view of this, what gets measured gets done. It is a clear and improved representation within national measurement frameworks that is needed to highlight the value of heritage, the better integration of it within wider areas of public policy, and the essential part of mainstreaming heritage within development planning so that it can be more fully integrated and a larger part of our universal understanding of well-being. The first case study of this week will be on Historic England, the organisation and NGO based in the UK, social and economic research into heritage well-being as a implementational framework for community well-being. The research th through Historic England has shown that interaction with heritage or the historic environment can be a positive factor in supporting individual and community well-being. Their well-being heritage focuses have been on the idea that heritage can help with veterans, help with those living with dementia, bringing communities together, helping create healthy communities, helping create monumental improvement, helping support people with learning difficulties, helping heritage rejuvenations, based on robust research that reducing detachment and potential exclusion from educational settings, reducing chances of entering criminal justice systems, increasing ability to reach young people's potential by developing resilience, autonomy and relatedness, enhancing mental and physical health, life skills, self-esteem and self-expression. All these areas of research interest have 
shown through Heritage Wellbeing's research that heritage can connect people to places. The Heritage Wellbeing research has shown that the running of a project working with local residents in the Sutherland area of England within one of the heritage active zones has shown that a particular project carried out by ERS consultancy in partnership with the local offices of engagement and community engagement showed that engaging the people who live, work and go to school in the area, focusing on how improvements to their local historic buildings are affecting them, showed that giving an understanding and an understanding of difference being made by heritage active zones in terms of what people think about their area, their sense of belonging and their pride within it and their place within it showed that it was a rather successful investigation in how you can connect local residents to their communities and increase their sense of well-being. Therefore, the studies have shown that heritage works with social prescribing and what, that a well-being and heritage strategy through Historic England has seen that there is a need for a strategy for well-being and heritage that can be a powerful and positive influence in people's lives. It can help understand where we come from and what gives us pride and confidence in the places where we live and work. Furthermore, they've found that heritage brings people together and provides the foundation for a prosperous future. Historic England's work in this area has had significant impact and reach, but we all know that there is more that we can do to address well-being inequalities through heritage. People have uneven and unequal opportunities in life, different life satisfaction and mental health ranging from positive to negative. So the result of where they live and how their varying mental health needs are affected and addressed is variable. The impact furthermore of COVID has exacerbated these inequalities and created new ones. Heritage is everywhere though, and it is in the building structures and open spaces that surround us. It is the ground beneath us and it is the wide open spaces of our countryside and urban landscapes. Yet, heritage is still considered a fragile and often hidden commodity. It needs to be revealed and nurtured to extract the benefits it can give us and bring to us in our futures. Unlocking the potential of our heritage is what the research of Historic England is trying to do. Therefore, by helping people discover and celebrate their shared history and their shared heritage identities through shared knowledge, they are trying to enable people to, date, to take an active role in decisions about their future and their heritage identity and community identities. Furthermore, this approach is, under Historic England, a successful place that people can proudly call their heritage and furthermore see their heritage as their home. All these are ways in which they can make a positive and successful impact on their general well-being as citizens and communities. The strategic approach of Historic England will try and enable the collective communities through their own evidence and modelling to build heritage well-being within their communities Furthermore, to affect the healthcare and achieve stronger and more long lasting outcomes, to create more sense of equality, equality and unilaterally affect the whole of England and furthermore, our global community. The second case study of this week will be looking at what works wellbeing framework on their understanding of heritage and wellbeing and its connection. Recent surveys in England shown by the What Works Wellbeing Framework have shown that 95% of adults think it is important to look after heritage buildings, while 73% have visited a heritage site over the last 12 months. Over 315,000 people 
were heritage volunteers and 80% of people thought that local heritage makes their area a better place to live. The scoping review of these results set out the state of evidence on the impact of interacting with heritage on our well-being. Furthermore, it finds that historic places, assets and associated activities and interventions can have a wide range of beneficial impacts on our physical, mental and social well-being within communities. The key messages from the What Works Wellbeing framework are that the evidence of um, these results shows a positive effect on community well-being, including outcomes on social relationships, sense of belonging, pride of place, ownership, and collective empowerment. The evidence is of mixed quality, which reflects the fact that studies designed to explore such complexities are often not fully captured and seen within reviews that there are evidence to show gaps in the research, which is something that needs to be addressed, but the potential negative impacts of interventions appear to be minimal and related more to the design and delivery of an intervention rather than the idea of heritage as a well-being in and of itself. Furthermore, heritage-based cultural activities in museums heritage object handling in hospital, healthcare and related settings, visiting museums, historic houses and other heritage sites, and heritage-based social engagement and inclusive projects are all ways to engage communities in a greater sense of well-being and heritage identity connection. These are all ways in which heritage and what works well-being framework are utilizing and engaging communities in addressing their sense of heritage to increase their sense of well-being. So today was a mostly overview and explanation of the idea of what heritage is, what community heritage is, and how that all fits in and affects our sense of individual, social, and overarchingly global well-being through the micro uh, ways in which it affects us at an individual level, all the way to how it affects us within institutional and bureaucratic structures, such as understanding heritage well-being's place within the GDP. Next week will be a roundup week, and it will be more focused on addressing Furthermore, the assessment that's going to come up, which will be due two weeks after the end of this course, um, and also just a way to round up the past six weeks and look at what we learned from each case study and lecture.